So this month, if you've been watching or if you've missed any weeks the last couple weeks or if this is your first time, uh, we've been talking for the last month about this idea called bad religion when Christianity goes wrong. And we're going to flip it on its head and reverse it because we've been looking at the many ways in which Christians get it wrong, the way we get it wrong, and how we, what we believe is wrong and all that stuff. But today we're going to flip it and we're not just going to focus on bad religion when it goes wrong. Let's today, only today, and we're going to wrap up the series today thinking and reflecting on good religion when Christianity goes right. How do you know you are getting it right or how do you know you have it right right there? And that is what we're going to talk about today. And one of the key elements, one of the key elements to know that you are doing it right or that you got it right is in this last, in this, wrapped up in this word right here. Ready? Some of y'all aren't going to like this word. Just get ready. Evangelism. That's when you know you're getting it right. Evangelism. I told you some of y'all be like, that's not what I wanted to hear this morning. I was, some of y'all, I know I, I, the, the hairs on the back of your neck stood up a minute ago because, uh, evangelism? You probably associate, because I know I have, you probably associate evangelism with uh, being scared, uh, afraid, or uh, I don't want to bother somebody. I mean, so many believers tend to have this stigma with this word, evangelism, because it sounds, you know, kind of fancy and kind of, maybe you've had some people kind of do something to you, or you've been afraid to. I know I was. Guys, I'm going to be real with you, super transparent. And when I was younger, all right, before being a pastor, when I was younger, I was afraid to tell people about Jesus, because in my mind, I'm like, you know what? If I get it wrong, they're going to go to hell because of me, all right? Like, literally, that's the way I thought. I'm like, if I go out there and give this spiel, and they're like, shh. Look at really, bro. Ah. And then they're standing before heaven, you know, be standing before God on judgment day. And then, you know, God forbid, you know, they, they get separated. How to get away from me? I never knew you. And they go send to hell. And I'm like, man, why'd you send me that fool? I mean, the way he told me, the way he explained it to me, man, if you would send somebody else, I would have got it. But man, that's on you. And I was so afraid of that. Am I the only one? I don't know. Am I the only one? If if so, then whatever. Okay. I was always afraid of, man, somebody's going to go to hell because of me, because I said it wrong, or I was this, or I was that. And oh my gosh, how selfish and stupid and foolish was I? I was more concerned about people rejecting me than rejecting Jesus. That fear was out of selfishness. That was on, that was, that was me. I, I cared more about their opinion of me than them hearing and knowing who God was. I'm being real. Okay? And look, and I'm going to, let me just be real too. This actually even bothered me even when I started to be a pastor over 10 years ago. Like I always choked up at the end. I always choked up when I was trying to tell people, if you don't believe, because I was, I was like, am I saying it right? Am I doing it right? I'm, oh my gosh. And so I was, listen, I guys, I want you to know that as we finish with this today, as we're looking at this, because part of good religion is being able to tell others. That's what evangelism is, guys. Evangel just means to tell the good news. It's just to be a messenger. That's all it is. It is simple. And we're going to look at that today because it's important. <clears throat> it's important that we understand because, and, and here's the other excuse, actually. Before I say this, let me get y'all right here. Because some of you guys either are emotional if you're a believer in Christ. Let's be real. Like some of y'all head nodding with me. It was like, all right, you, we're, we're tracking together. Maybe you get overwhelmed and you overthink it. Oh, I don't want to bother them, you know. If I, am I going to say this? What are they going to think? You know, it's like, okay, you know, listen, you, would, you wouldn't be bothering me if I was going to walk into head-on collision traffic, right, and I'm walking into the street, I don't see a car coming, and you come and shove me out the way, yeah, that's going to hurt. I'm going to get up and look at you like, what you doing? But when I see that car kind of, oh, you saved me, thank you, all right? So I'm appreciate that. You're not bothering me if you're trying to save me, all right? That's different. But the other thing that I know a lot of us, and me too, I've thought about this, is, yo, all right, evangelism, yeah, that's important. But, yo, that's your job, though. That's your job. I got my job. You got you. Well, why do I give offering for it? I'm paying you, right? And I was like, listen, listen. Not everybody is called to be in full-time vocation, okay? Not every Christian is called to be in full-time vocation, meaning that you have a job, that that is your primary duty, 24 hours, seven days a week, whatever it is, that's what you do. Very few are called to full-time vocation. But 
Every believer is called to be a full-time Christian. You got it? Every believer is called to be a full-time Christian. And part of that includes not only you growing in your faith, but sharing your faith. And my goal, and I, and I believe that today we're all going to walk away today realizing that, you know what? Growing in your faith and especially sharing your faith is actually easier and more exciting than you've ever thought. And so we're going to look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 and 22. And we're going to look at something that Jesus said, which is going to be great for all of us today. Matthew 4, 18 and 22. Just a little prequel here. This is God. This is Jesus himself. And he is about to gather and call his apostles for the first time. And so that's the context, all right? So we're going to read verse 18 through 22, just a couple verses. So let's read it together. We're going to put it on screen for everybody here and online so we can all track together. As he, Jesus, was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter. That's the Peter that we all recognize if you have seen movies or read about the Jesus and his apostles before. So he has two brothers, Peter and his brother Andrew. They were, this is really important, guys, online, I want you to write it. Everybody else in-house, I want you to say casting, please. Okay, it's important. All right, write it online, casting. Andrew and Simon, or Peter and Andrew, were casting their nets into the sea because they were fishermen. Follow me, Jesus tells them, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, which is the same John, the Apostle John, John 3, 16, that guy. They were in a boat with Zebedee, their father, and they were, say with me, preparing. They were preparing their nets, okay? Two brothers, two sets of brothers, two, two different things with their nets. They were preparing their nets, and Jesus called them, same thing, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people immediately they left their boats and their father and followed him. So this is at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. He's getting ready. He's beginning to call now these first 12 disciples, which would be the apostles that God would use, that Jesus himself would use to be able to turn the whole world upside down, all right, in a positive, actually turn the whole world right side up. And so these 12 were huge. This was very important. But what's important, guys, is the quality of the people that God chose. See, here, if you can imagine, all right, I'm God. I got to pick a squad, all right? I got to pick a squad of 12 people. All I got is a dozen. All right, then I better get the best dozen because this dozen is what's going to launch the most important, the important mission ever in history. The creation and expansion of the church that is called to bring people to new life in Jesus Christ. He got 12. Let's just assume, all right, well, there's a reason for the 12, but we'll just go. I only got 12. If you had a very important mission in life and you had to create a team to do it, you're going to pick the best of the best, right, if you could. Right? Imagine the project. Imagine the mission. You are going to want to try to get the best of the best. This is why when you ever play sports, right, you don't go, mm, I want the least athletic with my number one pick, all right? No, all right? That, that's your last, okay? I know the feeling. I know the feeling. You're the last one to get picked because you're going to want, I want that tall buff dude over there that looked like he can plow through a couple people. I want him, all right? I want that. Are we playing basketball? I want the six foot seven guy. I don't want the kid that's over here, you know, four six, like <laughs> huffing wind and it was during layups. No, I want the big guy, right? And so we're going to pick the best of the best. And so here's Jesus, and what he does is he doesn't do that. He calls certain people, hey, follow me, and I'm going to make you fishermen. Follow me. These 12 that he picked weren't the best of the best. The majority of them were fishermen. Others were, one was a tax collector. Others had different jobs. But the reason why we know they weren't the best of the best is because they were not rabbis. See, Jesus was doing a very practical thing, which a lot of rabbis would do in Jewish culture. They would go and, and see, the rabbis were like the upper class. They were the smarts. They were the elite. Everybody looked up to them. And you, here's what happened when you go to school. This was Jewish education. You grew up in school, and you went as far as your academic and, and your, acad, you know, your, not academic, your intellectual capacity can get you. This, there is no, no child left behind. No, they left you behind if you were dumb, dumb, okay? If you couldn't get it, I'm like, oh, you can make it a third grade, and that's all oh, for, you struggling? Cut, all right? Uh, you're done. And no, that's, that's what they would do. And so you would go to school, and the ones who would keep going are the ones who could handle it, show proficiency, all right? And if you got to a level that's like, this is it, you hit your capacity, 
all right, now your school is, you got to go to your trade school. And normally what they would do is they would go and whatever the father was doing, whatever the family business was, that's what they did. I.e., you have James and John with their father fishing. That was his trade. That means that his, their daddy wasn't the sharpest tool and neither were them. Okay. None of these guys were, if you think about it. And so here's the thing, guys, every child wanted to grow up being able to sit at the feet of a rabbi. That was the right here. Nothing better, nothing like it. And when you, when a rabbi would say, follow me, that was a thing of honor. It was like, oh my gosh, it's like you're chosen. And if you're chosen, it's because you've been examined and proven to be worthy. Yet the fact that these other four people and the majority of them were fishing shows that they weren't worthy. And that's what's so beautiful about God is that God doesn't call the best. He calls those who are not. He calls the willing. You know, he goes to them and says, you get a second chance. You want to follow me? They knew. This is why they dropped their nets so quickly. If you wonder, what the heck? That's weird. A random stranger. Follow me. And just, whoo, they take off. Brother, uh, do, how is he not going to, like, kidnap you right now? What are you doing? Like, you know, I got some candy. No, don't, don't go there. No, man. No, no, no. Now you understand why they were so willing to lay their nets down so fast. Because they were given a second chance to sit at the feet of a rabbi, which was huge for that culture. And so, guys, that's so beautiful because, listen, Jesus, when he calls us and invites us to follow him, he doesn't even call you because, oh, bro, listen, you a champ, bro. You a champ. You a beast. You a boss. You a queen. And I'm choosing you to follow me because you are so special. No. And, by the way, there is not one of us that can qualify that. He calls the willing. And those who follow him are those who are willing to follow Jesus. And so that's so beautiful of how he views us. But... Here's the thing, though. Notice that Jesus said something important. He didn't just say, follow me. He said, and. Follow me, and I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Guys, I want you to know that's a package deal. It goes together. Following Jesus and fishing for people. And see, the problem is, is that I, we talked about this earlier. I had the tendency, and I know a lot of believers in the house and watching online have had this tendency, too, to do one and neglect the other. You do one and neglect the other. Like, yo, I go to church, I read my Bible, I spend my time, I worship, I do my thing. I'm spending my time with God. Awesome. When was the last time you ever had a conversation with somebody that was God-related? Well, I'm going to see what happened, right? And then whatever the excuse is, I'm like, oh, I just don't know anyone. I'm not, nah, nah, and then it keeps going. But I want you guys to know, all of us, I've been, I've, I'm been and still can be. I'm telling you, I still can be very tempted. To do this too, especially as a pastor, let me be real. It is very easy for me to get so caught up in books that I don't get interact with people. Okay, so I have to be careful with that. All of us do. All of us do. And so the thing is, guys, we should not, and we do one, we shouldn't neglect the other. And so we are called to do both. Say, follow me and fish for people. All right, both. So now what does that mean, though? Let's break that down, guys. Let's break that down. What does that mean? When Jesus says, follow me. Again, we talked about that. That was what rabbis did, and they told people, follow me. And the point, if you were a disciple of a rabbi, you were called to follow this rabbi, and you would sit at the feet of rabbi, this rabbi. That's why, if you've ever read the Bible and the Gospels, why are so many people sitting at Jesus' feet? That was the posture of a learner. They were in school. Class was in session, and Jesus is dishing out gold, all right? And so that's what they were doing. So to follow Jesus is to be a disciple. And, and really, the word disciple means a learner. That's it. So following Jesus means you are learning about who this man is. You are, not only, you are not learning who he is, but you are learning from this person. To follow Jesus is to learn. You got that? It is, by the way, a lifelong learner. All right? Just because you can go, and let's say you hit, yo, I, I hit, you know, I had 10 years in following Jesus. I've memorized X amount of Bible verses, went through X amount of discipleship classes. I got my certificate. I'm done. No, okay? There is no level that you stop learning, just like in human, just like us in regular life. We are called to be lifelong learners. Some of you guys don't go to school, right? You don't go to school, but you're still learning at the job and this and that. You were constantly called to be same thing. When it comes to our faith and we follow Jesus, we ought to be learning. And not just learning new things, sometimes relearning, guys. 
We, we, we need to relearn things. Why do you think we read the same book every single, <laughs> every single week, every single day? We're constantly rereading the same book because it's important to learn and relearn and to remember and review. This is part of following Jesus. And remember, one of the brothers was doing something with nets. Two groups, two and two different things. And by the way, when you think fishing, because they were all fishermen, maybe you think of this. Can we put that first picture up? When you think of fishing, you probably think of this. Let's put the first one up. Of that guy all by himself. Some of y'all are going to get in your, oof, you, uh, you, be, you wish you were there right now. I think we, we almost got it. Uh, there's a one, the first picture of the, usually with a, ca- with a reel and a cast. That's that solo fish. Anybody fishermen in the house? Y'all like to fish, yes or no? Right? This is, some, this is your happy place for some of you guys, yes or no? Some of y'all are like, nah, but it is, whatever. Some, but maybe when you think of fishing, you probably think of this, okay? One man out there, one person, one rod, one reel, one piece of bait, and you're going one at a time. Okay, this is not how the these guys were fishing this is the image of fishing i want you to see let's put the other one please this is what they were doing they weren't using a rod and reel they were using nets and if you've ever had to use a net this is what they would do right you're just throwing it out there and obviously it's weighted so it goes down and hopefully traps with the large surface area traps uh, all that fish and you pull it up and also guys i want you to know that using nets was a team effort Notice here, you got Jesus, right? It's a little classic picture. A lot of images there you see uh, in movies, the same thing. Casting your nets was a team effort. Same thing, guys, when it comes to evangelism. It's not a solo mission. It's a team effort. That's why we talk about it at church. All right, so eyes up here, and we can get, get that picture off there. So now you got the image of a net. So you were doing one of two things with your nets. You're either casting your net, which is you're throwing it, or you are preparing, or a better word, mending your nets. And that's the word that when we say follow Jesus, when we follow Jesus and learn, we are, that's how we mend our nets. See, these kind of fishermen, guys, as they would throw these nets, they would have to drag these nets. Sometimes it would catch rocks and debris in the water. And it would might, you know, those rocks would cause tears and rips in the nets. Or because it would be used so much, and if you would get a lot of fish and you're pulling, there's a lot of tension on those things. And so maybe with the fish fighting, right, they're resisting. And so we've all seen Finding Nemo, yes or not? Okay, we've all seen Finding Nemo, it just keeps swimming, just keep, right? And so we've seen that, we see what that's like. There's a lot of pressure on those nets, and so the nets tend to break. So if you're not casting, you need to mend the nets, which is just you find the holes and you close them back up. Because if not, fish are going to get out. The one tear will be bigger. And then, you know, that's your livelihood. So part of fishing is to mend your nets. Guys, that is what following Jesus is about. When we sit and when we learn, which is, by the way, this is what we're doing now. We're doing this right now. We are opening God's word. We're allowing him to speak to us. We are learning. We are mending our nets right now. Because it is the word of God that examines our hearts, examines our minds, and renews our minds. Because you and I, we can go through this world and there can be thought processes or actions and things that we do that can affect that. And, you know, we we have wounds and different things. But when we sit at the feet of Jesus, he mends our nets. He heals our wounds. He repairs our minds. He changes our thinking. Our minds and our hearts are mended. That is not something we do. That is something that God does when we sit at his feet. You hear me? That is what we're doing. We are asking when we gather together to worship or to read, whether on Sunday or every day, we are asking the Lord, mend the nets of my heart and mind. That is what following Jesus is all about. Because listen, if you throw a net full of a bunch of holes, that's no good. And that's no good. And so that's so important for us to make sure we are taking time in the worship and in the word of God. Because when we worship God and when we're in his words, by the way, are not two separate things. We're doing it right now. Okay, worship is not just what you declare. Worship is also what you hear and responding. That is you are you are worshiping right now. If you are responding to God's word in your heart, that is worship. So that is what's so important is the mending of our hearts and minds. That is what it means to follow Jesus and to follow Jesus. Listen, means he takes number one priority. Christ now takes number one priority. He is the leader that you follow. We've all played that game when you were kids, right? Follow the leader. Simon says whatever they do, you do. That's it. Jesus has to be the number one influence in your life, number one priority in your life. It is now Jesus. There's a lot of people who want to follow Jesus, but what they really want to do is they want Jesus to follow them. Like saying, God, I am only following you so that you can mend the wounds of me, you know, mend my guilt, mend my shame. 
I live a kind of way and kind of feel a kind of way, and I know I shouldn't do it, but I just follow you enough just to appease my guilt and conscience, but I still want to run my own life. I need you just to follow me to help me if I mess up to fix it and just to kind of bless my plans and wishes. No, Jesus don't follow you. We follow him. He takes number one priority in our life, number one. His, that relationship with Christ must be above it all. If it costs you every relationship, it matters because the relationship that we have with Jesus is actually helps us in all of the other relationships. Listen, moms, you want to be a better mom? Learn to be a better daughter of the living God. That's it. If you, that's literally, you want to be a better husband, a better wife. The, the greater you grow in your relationship with God, the more you prioritize your relationship with Christ, it will overflow in every one of your relationships. This is why we prioritize him. And I'm going to be real. You also have to prioritize the relationships with other believers. Because we mend our hearts and minds, not through Christ and also with one another. When I see that you're wounded, I pray and encourage you. And when I'm wounded and I, fight, I fail, I mess up, you give me grace and love me. You see that? We mend our nets together. That's what James and John were doing. They were mending the nets together. And that's important for us to love one another in that way. But that means we got to prioritize this one. Because it is through our relationship with Jesus and other true believers that impacts every other relationship. If you want to be, if you want to be a better parent, better husband, better wife, better everything else, you got to focus on your relationship and growing in Christ. Now, that one's all beautiful, but, we're gonna, but remember, we're not stopping there. Because what did Jesus say? He said, follow me, which is all of this, which is all awesome, right? We all, like, yeah, sign me up for this. What did Jesus say? Follow me and uh, what else? What's the other equation? Don't be like, oh, I wasn't paying attention. No, see, we can't neglect the other. Come on now. What, what is the other one? Follow me and what else you got to do? Fish for people. What does that mean? I'm going to fish for people. Oh, but, oh don't, don't miss the word. Jesus didn't miss. Follow me, your responsibility, and I will make you fishers of men. Whose responsibility is to make you a fisher of men? Not you. Jesus. When you focus on him, when you grow in him, he's going to work in you. He's, that's his responsibility. By the way, he didn't say, I might, I could, if I got time. He said, I will. That is a promise of God. If we prioritize and grow in our relationship with God, he says, I promise I'm going to make you, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. That's my job. You can't do that yourself. You can't, you know, learn to get there on your own. That is the living God that does that in you. And so in the same way that we are called to mend our nets daily in the word, mend our nets and our souls and our spirits and our minds, we are called to mend relationships. We are called to mend those things daily. But we are also called to cast our nets regularly. And casting our nets is it both done in prayer and in practice. Okay, we've been talking about that. This is one of the things with bad religion is that right there. It's the practice that we've been focusing on. But see, that's part of casting your net. It's being a light. It's loving others. It's reflecting Christ. If following Jesus and mending your nets is learning, casting your nets and fishing for people is loving. It's the outside. It is what comes in, must comes out. It just doesn't work with food, okay? It works with faith, okay? What comes in, it's going to come out. And so what is the outlook like? What's the outlook like? That's, that can tell you the quality of the intake. The quality of the intake is going to determine the quality of the expression. That's what matters. And so casting our nets is done in words and deeds, and now I might be tracking with you guys and so far, okay, I'm good. Yeah, yeah, I got you. We do it in deeds. Yep, yep, yep. I was like, hey, 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 I said words and deeds. Remember, we talked about this also. If you have been following me, and we've been doing this this last week, being a believer in Christ, casting your nets is not just doing good things. That's part of it, yes. It's doing good things and saying hard things. Casting your nets does include you telling people about who Jesus is, what he's done in their life, and yes, the fact that if they don't believe in Christ, eternity in heaven is not a reality for them. I know that's hard. You're going to sound crazy. I get it. 
Okay, we're telling a bunch of people some Jewish dude 2,000 years ago died on some wooden beam, rose from the dead three days later. By the way, he knows you and he loves you. You want to believe and be saved? What? I know it's weird. I know. Paul admitted that. It's crazy for some people to hear this stuff. It, it's, but that's on, forget it, that's on them. But it's part of it, guys. It is learning to do good things, say hard things. It is done in our prayers. When you pray, when you pray, who other than you would be happy if God answered every single one of your prayers? I want you to pause for a second. Because I know I, it, it's easy for me to pray about me and for me. If God answered all of your prayers, who other than you would be happy? Meaning, how often do you spend time praying for others? How often do you spend time praying for non-believing friends to know Jesus? Or do you, is your prayer normally, help me deal with him, okay? Right? Like, is that in your prayer for maybe for non-believers? Is like, just help me deal with this guy. Help me deal with my boss. Help me deal with these children, spawns of Satan themselves. I don't know, like whatever, right? It's like, help me deal, right? I know maybe that could be some of your prayers is, help me deal. No, no, no. How often do we pray for non-believers and say, Lord, save them. I pray that they may know you. Ooh, and an even bolder one. I pray that you may help me lead them to you. When was the last time you prayed that one? That's huge. That's important, guys. It's, this is the prayer and they practice. We are called to mend our nets spiritually daily and cast our nets regularly in what we do and in what we say. Both, guys, go together. You can't do one and neglect the other. It is the profession, the declaration, profession of our faith and the practice of our faith. It is the instruction and the application. It is study. It is service. It is worship. It is work. It goes together. It goes together. And that is why today I want to ask you a question. Now, I want to talk to believers in the house. I want to talk to everybody who claims to be a follower of Jesus, which is a better phrase than Christian, okay? Christian, you guys know that Christian was a derogatory term. It was an insult, okay? When some, in, the, in the Bible, it was only, the word Christian was only used maybe four, a couple times, and it was used to insult all oh, these Christians. It was a slang. It was a slam to be called a Christian, being Christian means Christ-like, and so we're not, you know, we're not throwing that time away. We want to reflect Christ. We want to be like Christ. But the word that was used primarily in the New Testament was being a follower of Jesus. Because to follow Jesus means he's number one, and he's ref I'm reflecting in my life. He is being reflected in my life. And so I'm going to ask, I want to so every follower of Jesus, I want to ask this question right now. Who is your one that you are praying for? Now, we should have more than one, but there is every, everybody in this place should have at least one. Right now, should, somebody should be coming to mind. I pray that the Holy Spirit may bring somebody to your mind right now. A cousin, a sibling, somebody in your house, somebody in your neighborhood. Maybe somebody you grew up with that you, know, you still maintain relationship through social media. Okay? Maybe that. Maybe it's a coworker. You know, like, listen, they don't show any expression. They don't show a life that follows Christ. Listen, some of you guys might have some Christians that aren't saved. It's like name only. Like, they, they, they just do the external stuff, but you know them. You're like, yo, I don't see fruits in your life, bro. I don't know. That might be a person God's putting in your heart. Guys, this is where part of this thing is who who are you praying for? Do you have one right now? Anybody have one right now? That you are, Yep, oh, easy, that's easy. I mean, I got like 21 right now, maybe. Who is your one that you are praying for? That is a commitment that I want us as a church. We're going to practice this because we need this. We need this. And so for the next 30 days, I want you to create a habit of having, just pick one. I know you probably have more than one, but I just want you to pick one person. And for the next 30 days, I want you to pray for this one person. That number one, that they may know Christ. And number two, that bold enough that God may use you to lead them to Christ. All right? For 30 days, the reason why we want to practice this for 30 days is to create a habit of learning to pray for others. You got it? That's the idea. We want to be able to develop this habit. If you don't have it, if you do, awesome. Keep going. But if you don't, we need to develop this habit. We are called to follow Jesus and they both go together, and if you're not doing the second one, it is harming and holding you back from following Jesus and growing in your faith. How can you grow in your faith if you're ashamed to share it? Hear that me. You hear me? You hear me now? You can't grow in your faith if you're ashamed to share it. And so that's an important one. And so for 30 days now, let me give you a little disclaimer. 
if at the end of 30 days, this person you're praying for does not believe in Jesus and they don't, you know, they are not saved and you tried and you, man, you gave it your all. You gave a full court press. I mean, you laid it out and they still said, no, congratulations, you succeeded. You succeeded. You did not fail. If you prayed for somebody for 30 days and shared your faith and they rejected it, you didn't fail. You didn't. Because you know what? First off, you never know. Maybe God can use you in your prayers for 30 days and in anything you've said and done in these next 30 days. It may start something that someone else later on is going to come and finish the job. And it's okay, guys. Listen, we're all on the same team if that's the case. Paul himself said it. Some of us plant seeds. Other of us, you know, we, we pluck the fruit. It is the Holy Spirit that does all the watering. It's in between. But we're called to do either or. So it's okay if you don't get the credit, guys, right now on this side. It's all right. It's okay. By the way, if you lead somebody to Christ, I guarantee you there's been dozens of other people that have been laying the groundwork. So don't think yourself so fancy, all right? I was like, you mean so special. There were people who put some work and prayers in. Some moms that were praying for that person for decades before you just showed up and said something. Oh, like you get all the credits. That's all on you. No. Okay. But let me tell you, because I know this one's a big one. A lot of people and some of y'all, I've had a conversation with you guys recently. You've been afraid to share your faith because you felt like failing. That was me. Afraid to fail. What if I do it and they don't believe? Listen, failure is not to say anything at all. That is failing. Being faithful is doing your part. Guys, this is what I said a minute ago. Sharing your faith is easier than you think. Your job, open your mouth. God's job, open their minds. That's it. That's what it does. Guys, listen, anybody who is a believer in Christ Jesus, it is because God himself opened your mind and showed you he is who he says he is. And he showed you, I am, he, I am who he says I am, a sinner. And he opened up your mind, but this is where it works. When we open up our mouths and speak, it is God who opens up his minds. Listen, as a pastor, for my, the beginning, especially when I started, I struggled. And I put so much effort into what I'm saying because I didn't want to even get this wrong or anything like that. But I've come to realize the same thing that Paul would say. Listen, it is not my fancy words or my analogies or any of those things that will save you because it is not on me. It is the spirit of the living God who does that. I'm just faithful enough to open up my mouth, and I trust in God to open up your mind. That's it. But that's how it works, guys. We are, we are faithful. We don't fail if you open up your mouth. No, you are faithful if you open up your mouth, and then God will open up their minds. But that is an important one. That is an important one. But I want you guys to reflect on this. I asked you, who's your one? Who is somebody that you will commit to pray for for the next 30 days? But I want you to reflect on this now, and I'm talking to Christians, okay? If you are not fishing, you're not following. I'm going to be real. I ain't pulling any punches with you guys. Listen. If you're not fishing, you're not following. If you aren't actively praying for people, if you are not, I mean, listen, fishing looks a whole different for a lot of people. Uh, you can go, you fish on social media, right? You can put your stuff out there. You got followers. You got people that follow you, like you. Hey, throw something out there. You know, throw a little line here. You never know. Casting the net was just random. And I'm like, look, I'm going to throw the biggest one possible, and hopefully something happens. That's what we're called to do. You, with social media, you guys have an opportunity. But don't be some social media activist. I'm like, I did my shares. I did my post. That's enough. No, okay? Face-to-face, -to -face too, okay? Come on now. Don't, don't cheat. Don't cheat. Face-to-face, -face, in person, man-to-man, -man, all right? Woman-to-woman, -woman, do that, all right? And so, but all of that, we're called to cast those nets. But I want you to know, if you are not fishing, if you are not actively praying for people to come to know Jesus, if you are not praying, Lord, lead me, I'm talking to Christians now, if you are not doing that, if you are not actively serving others, loving others in that way, so that, I'm like, man, why are you the way that you are? Oh, let me tell you about Jesus. If you, uh, uh, I just woke up, I'm just having a good day today. You know, I'm, uh, no, listen, if you're not fishing, you're not following. Jesus said it goes together. If you're not fishing, you're not following. Sincere prayers, sincerity of prayer should lead to, to, should lead to sincerity of practice. If you sincerely ask the Lord to save you from your sins, you will sincerely practice. Now, I said practice. I didn't say get it right. Practice sometimes learn, that involves learning, right? Practice means it's learning. It's growing. But sincerity of prayer leads sincerity of practice. There's, listen, there's a lot of people who have, number one, 
come to a front, you know, if they come to the front on a church Sunday, or they've raised their hands at the end of a service, they've even got baptized, and they kind of felt it, they kind of knew it, they had this emotional moment, but then months, years later, they're the same person that they were before. Listen, just because you raised your hand, said yes to a prayer, repeated after the pastor, or even got baptized, that doesn't mean that you're saved. Just because you did those things, what is the outflow of your life? Some of you guys, who knows, you might have professed and you might have got baptized, but maybe something else is going to happen. Listen, I just want you to know that was me. I'm not the smartest guy in the, I'm not the, smartest guy in the room, never. Okay? I'm a little slow. It takes me a while to get things. And I grew up in a church. Daddy, my pastor, went to private Christian school my whole life, and it took me 18 years to finally get it. So I'm a little slow, okay? I am. I got it. It took me, I'm a little stubborn. It took me 18 years. I remember the day that I asked Jesus to be my Savior. I was Josiah's age. He was my, he's my nine-year-old. I was around his age. And I remember it was Easter, all right? My dad was Jesus in a play, okay? My dad was, my dad was always Jesus in a play. He always had that role, okay? He was Jesus. And I remember seeing this play. And deep down, this wasn't just a thing. Deep down, it's like I knew, even as a little kid, this is real. Something about this is real. And I want, I want it to be real. Again, nine years living it. I want it to be real. Okay. I sincerely prayed, Jesus, save me. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Got it. Okay. Um, tack on another nine years. All right. No practice, no fruit. Yeah, I, I was serving God. I was on the worship team, you know, doing some stuff. And, and yeah, I, I, would, I would do things, and I still, I, I loved God. I believed in God, but I was still Lord of my own life. And I was not following Jesus. I was following Jesus just enough to, so that I can do what I wanted to do, but yet he's still close enough that I can throw that Hail Mary, forgive me, help me, for, you know, appease my guilt, thank you for loving me, and I'm going to still keep living my life. I was that guy. That's what I did. Remember, I told you, our job is to open up our mouths. Only God can open up our minds. I told you, I remember the day that I asked Jesus to be my Lord and Savior, but I remember the day he opened up my mind. I remember the day he opened up my mind. And everything that I had come to know, it was different. It was not when I was nine. I was 16, 17, whatever it was. He opened up my mind, and I saw him for who he was, and I saw, oh, my gosh. What have I done? I'm not. I realize he opened up my mind to say, yeah, you, you said that prayer. You meant it when you were a little kid. But it wasn't real. He opened up my mind and I saw. I felt the chains from hell that were still tugging on my heart. I realized I was not. He opened up my mind. And when I repented, it wasn't just a forgive me of my sins. I believe in you. Help me to follow you. Amen. This, when he opened up my mind, I wanted to do nothing but die. I wanted to crawl in a hole and die. My first reaction was not, oh, God, I love you. It was how much I hated me because I saw me as a sinner for who I was when he opened up my mind. And I realized I have been trying to still save myself this whole time and do it better and get better. And I can't. And so my, my cry was not save me. It was save, save me. Save me. I, I, when I repented, there was remorse. There was remorse in my life. There was hatred towards what I was and what I'd become. I didn't want that. I, I wanted him. I believed it. But when I repented, there was remorse. And if you, I'm, so I want to ask you, if you have claimed to be a believer in Christ, if you claim to be a believer in Christ, are you growing to hate the very sin you used to love? Are you growing to hate the very sin you used to love? If not, that means you repented without remorse. You were just like, look, I just, I, I, heaven sounds awesome. I think I want to go there. Do you want to go to heaven because it sounds great? Or do you want to go to heaven because it's because Jesus is there? Because you want him. Not because you want the house or the this or want to see what the streets of gold is like. There's people who want to go to heaven and spend eternity with God in heaven and don't spend time with him on earth. Doesn't work that way. How are you think you're going to spend an eternity with God on earth? I mean, you're going to spend an eternity with God in heaven and you don't spend any time with him on earth? 
your repentance should come with remorse. Meaning, I've owned up. I know I have done wrong. I realize I opened, I, I, I had done the people that I love the most. I saw it. I did them wrong. I did them wrong. I did God wrong. And I knew I did not deserve that love and grace, but I was, I asked for it anyways because I felt him calling me and say, yeah, you see that? I've been seeing that this whole time. And I still love you. Follow me. And I will save you. I will forgive you. Follow me. I missed the cut and he still called me. That's all of us. If your repentance doesn't come with remorse, I pray that God may open up your eyes because you can't force this thing. He alone can open up your eyes. If you are not growing to hate the very sin you love, I have to help you and ask you with all the love to reconsider. Maybe that prayer, maybe that baptism, that maybe you didn't do it. There's still more that needs to be done. It took me a while. For some of you, maybe it could too. But maybe you could say yes if you're a believer in Christ. Yes, I, I do. I, I see that I am growing to hate the very sin that I used to love. And, and, and it bothers me that I still love certain sins. Great, that's actually good news. That is good news. If you're a believer in Christ and you are still, listen, yes, I hate the sin that I used to love. But I hate the fact that I still love this sin or that sin sometimes. That's a, that, that shows life. It shows that God is saying, good, look, that's the area. Now give me that one too. Give me that one too. Listen, guys, I want to warn you. And this is a good thing. Actually, not a, this is not a bad thing because God won't do this. When God opens up your mind to show you the sinner that you really are, that you are worse than you realize, he's not going to reveal everything to you. If God would open up your mind right now to help you see the sinner that you are, you would be pulverized. You couldn't handle it. You couldn't handle understanding the kind of person you actually are and what you have done towards people, towards God. You couldn't handle it. I could barely handle it when God did it for me. But see, when you follow Christ, he's going to continue to show, hey, there's still a little area left. Hey, there's still this, there's still that. You're still a believer. You're still saved. But he wants you. He wants those areas in your life so you can surrender that, so you can grow. That's the mending. That's the learning that we're talking about. It is not done in condemnation. It's done in love because he wants you to experience more. He wants you to draw closer. And he's going to ask you, look, he's going to reveal more and more to you because he loves you and he wants you to experience the fullness that is in him. But I want to tell you that a believers in Christ Jesus, remember, you follow and you fish. If you're not fishing, you're not following. A sign that you are saved is continual relationship. Continual. If you find yourself doing great for like a month and then boom, yeah, same old, same old, same old. Then you, got, you do better for two, three months, boom, you're that same person. That was me for years. I repented, but there was no remorse for what I was repenting for. I just felt guilty. I know I shouldn't have done it. There was no remorse. And guys, I, that is a wound that God is not slow to give. But that is a wound that is meant to heal. Just like a surgeon. A surgeon has to cut you up. He has to wound you to heal you, yes or no? A true surgeon has to wound you to heal you. That wound that comes from that revelation is meant to bring healing in your life. And it is the love, his love, his love that is the anesthesia that dulls the pain. Because when there is remorse when you repent, his love removes the remorse, removes the regret. And he brings healing to your life. Do you see why it's also easier and more exciting to share. Like, why would we not want to tell people about this? Telling people about God is just telling them that. Telling them who he is and what he means to you. It is as simple as that. And if we open up our mouth, God is faithful to open up their minds. But that's important. That is all we're called to do. And let me tell you, this world has a lot of great experiences. This world offers so many things, thrills and things to do. That is awesome. It is. This world is, offers a, a, so many great experiences, but there is no greater experience than having the mighty hand of God reach down, snatch you from the grip of hell, and then you see that very hand reach through you to do it again to somebody else. 
there is no greater experience than that. In fact, that is the only action that we do in this earth that will carry over. The money that you make, the degrees that you accumulate, the businesses that you start, the good deeds that you did, that stays here. The life that God used you to bless others, that goes with you. That stays together. And there is nothing greater than that. So I want to challenge you if you're a believer in Christ and you've been slacking on that, I hope there's remorse because there is some in me too. I hope there's remorse in that area. But lay it down at the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, may you be bold enough to say, Jesus, lead me. I pray, give me one person, one person to pray for that they may know you and help me lead them to you. Be bold to pray that prayer today for 30 days. God, give me one person to pray for and Jesus, help me lead them to you. And if you can't think of that one person, that one person's probably you. If you can't think of somebody, that person's you. And if it is, all right, if it is, it's good news. You missed the cut. So did I. And the same invitation that God gave me and so many one of us, he's given it to you. And this isn't just, just repeat after me and nothing like that. No, it, it comes from here. If you can't think of anyone else or if you are not sure, then you cry out to God and say, For, give me, save me. I can't save myself. Do that. You cry out to your God. Do that and call on his name. And know that all who do, you, God will help you. He will fix that. He, he's going to wound you, but he's going to heal you. And, he's gonna, and you are going to love every second of it because there is nothing like him. Because when you find Christ, when those who find Christ will follow him. And the reason why we follow him is because we have found life. Life that we can't find anywhere else. So follow him. And for the rest of us, keep following Jesus. There is nothing else better and no one greater. That is the most important thing that we are ever called to do. So I want to lead you guys. I want to, I'm going to pray for you right now. And I want you to know, some of you guys online, I can't see you, but I know God is working. I know it because it's not on me. It's not on my fanciness or whatever. I know it is the word of the living God that is active in your life. And so I want to pray right now for everybody here as believers in Christ. Number one, I pray for all. If you are a believer and you recognize that, you feel, you know that you have not. You are following Jesus. You're coming to Sundays. You're reading your Bible. You're growing in your faith but you are lacking in sharing your faith. We need to repent right now. May there be remorse. There's remorse still in my heart. There is. May there be remorse. Say, God, forgive me if I have not done enough. Forgive me if I have failed to speak and say. Forgive me if I put it on me. Forgive me for making it all about me. Come on, you got to you gotta mean it. Forgive me if I, for making it all about me, Lord. But I receive your love and forgiveness right now, and I thank you, God. I thank you that you, can, you won't even hold this against me, that you're, gonna, that you're washing this away. And I pray, Lord, I pray for every person I have failed to speak to, I, for every person, God, that I failed to lead them, Lord, I thank you that you have called someone else more faithful than me to be able to compensate. So, God, thank you for that. But, Lord, help me not to be that lazy. Help me not to make those excuses. I pray that for me, and I pray that for your body, for your believers, Lord, for your family right now. May we not come with excuses, but rather, Lord, may we be bold in our prayers and bold in our life and bold in our practice, Lord. I pray that you may help us to do that. And I know, I know that for the next 30 days, God, I know as we cast our net in prayer and as we cast our net in practice, I know that your word does not come back void, that these are prayers that you will hear. And God, I believe that countless lives will be impacted for the kingdom over the next 30 days and beyond. Because, Lord, it is you who will open up their minds. And so, God, we praise your name and we thank you. And I pray for all of us here, if you are watching online, live or on replay, and everybody else here, listen, you don't have to walk out of here with that regret or worry. Lay it at the foot of the cross. Call on his name right now. Call on his name. And he is faithful and just to forgive you and wash away every single one of your sins. When you repent with remorse, it will be removed because God's love is that real and powerful. And so just choose him, believe in him, trust in him, and may you follow him because there is none other greater. Jesus, thank you that you have called unworthy yet willing people to follow you. So Lord, 
by your spirit, may we be faithful in following you. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.